settled down quite a bit, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to COVID, you haven't seen him evolve into a little less of a, you know, hip replacement danger when he knocks you over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ah, that's that's the good sound. Um, so I'm I'm just watching everyone jump in here making sure all of our buttons are pressed. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you uh, so much for joining us for our live virtual event tonight with Margaret Rangel and Ed Turkington. I'm Jessica from the Country Bookshelf in Bozeman, Montana, coming to you from the ancestral unceded land of the Ipsaliki Crow, Kootenai, Bitterroot Salish, Cheyenne, Shoshone Bannock, Ochiti Shikoan, Kalispell, Pondere, South Pekani, Blackfeet, Northern Cheyenne, Chippewa Cree, Assiniboine, Ani, Gravant, and Dakota peoples, among others. We encourage those of you joining us from outside of Montana to investigate this, learn more about the land and the stories of the people that come from there. Um, we are also grateful to be in this virtual space with our fellow Books in Common Northwest stores, Palina Springs Books in Sisters, Oregon, and Madison Books in Seattle, Washington. Be sure to visit booksincommonnw.com for more information and, of course, to purchase your books from our series. Uh, and you can also follow us on Eventbrite to see more great events from Books in Common, including tomorrow night we're chatting with Theodore Van Alst and Stephen Graham Jones. So we'll hope to see y'all again soon. Before we get to our author conversation this evening, uh, just a little housekeeping. Uh, if you didn't purchase your copy of Graceland at Last or The Fortunate Ones when you registered, uh, you are welcome to do so. I'll be dropping a link into the chat, but you just visit booksincommonnw.com and click on the logo of your favorite sponsoring store. We are recording tonight's event and it will be viewable on the Books in Common Northwest YouTube channel after the event concludes. If you have questions for our panelists, please drop them in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or leave them in the chat and we'll get to them as time allows. If you run into any tech issues along the way, we do recommend exiting and re-entering the webinar. If that doesn't work, do look for that uh, live stream on our YouTube channel. And headphones will usually fix any issues that you run into in terms of sound. This is a shared creative space that we would like to remain safe for everyone that's joined us today. So inappropriate or offensive comments and questions will see the user removed from this space. But, all of that out of the way. Uh, it is my very great pleasure tonight to introduce our guests. Uh, we have Margaret Rankle, the author of Graceland at Last, and of course, a country bookshelf favorite, Late Migrations, which is was a Read with Jenna Today Show book club selection. She's a contrib contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, where her essays appear weekly. Her work has also appeared in Guernica, Literary Lit Hub, Proximity and River Teeth, among others. She was the founding editor of Chapter 16, the daily literary publication of Humanities Tennessee, and is a graduate of Auburn University and the University of South Carolina. She lives in Nashville. Ed Turkington's debut novel, Only Love Can Break Your Heart, was an ABA Indies Introduced selection, woo, uh, which is a top 10 list of the debut authors publishing in a particular season. And it was also an Indie Next pick, which is our favorite uh, list of forthcoming books each month. It was a Book of the Month Club main selection and a Southern Independent Booksellers Association bestseller. His second novel, The Fortunate Ones, now in paperback, uh, was published in January by Algonquin Books, a regular contributor to chapter16.org, his articles, essays, and stories have appeared in a variety of publications, including the Nashville Scene, Memphis Commercial Appeal, Knoxville News Sentinel, and Lit Hub. He too lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Without further ado, Margaret, Ed, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'll be back to share some questions a little later in the program. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Hey, Margaret. Hey, Ed. How you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm always doing great when I'm talking to you. I was also thinking just a second ago, she was holding those two books up that this might be uh, 
one of the few occasions when uh, people are talking and, and, and the authors uh, both wrote a book that is dedicated to the same person. <laughs> it's probably the only time. Yeah. How often does that happen when they it come out in the same year, especially? I know it doesn't happen very often. Are you well, going to tell who the same person he, is? He's a special, very special person. Uh, my mentor and my hero and your and husband. My husband. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and of course, mine's dedicated to you also. And for all of you people who are uh, with us today, uh, I can speak uh, from experience that if you know Margaret Wrinkle through late migrations and her columns in the Times, and if you've got a copy of Graceland at last and you've read it all and you think to yourself, uh, you know, she, she seems too good to be true. Uh, the answer is she's not. It's the real thing. She really is that good. I know from experience and the grace that she's shown me as a friend and, and as someone who has taught me a lot about how to be a writer and how to be a teacher and how to be a compassionate person and most importantly, how to be a parent. Uh, and so uh, she is the, the right person to be listening to and the right person to be uh, turning to uh, in your newspaper and in your books. Margaret's tagline on the New York Times is that she writes about the American South and flora and fauna and a few other things. And one of the things that Margaret and I actually uh, talked about a little bit before we came on was the issue of what exactly it means anymore when we say that we are talking about the South, or what does that what does that mean, uh, uh, you know, as a concept or a construct, uh, or being Southern, particularly in in in, in just the, the sort of whiplash that we've all experienced in the last couple of years. Uh, Margaret, what what now do you feel you mean when, or, or, or what you think people, or maybe a better question is, what do you think people mean when they ask you what it means to write about the South and what you mean when you actually do it? If that makes sense. Um, can I just correct one little thing about your incredibly um, generous introduction? Sure. I didn't teach you how to write, Ed. <laughs> you had an ISBN a long time before I had an ISBN number, but Back to the Southern. You writer. were correcting my sentences a long time before I had an ISBN <laughs> number. So I'm, I'm anyway, pull well, you're also it. way, way younger than I am. But, but so Southern writers, don't you think that when people talk about Southern right, Southern, when we think about Southern writers, we think about those old Southern lit classes that are, that were taught in college. And we're talking about usually, um, white people, white writers, and we're talking about writers who um, lived largely in a rural or small town setting. So we think about Flannery O'Connor and we think about Eudora Welty, we think about Faulkner. Um, and then we think about Sweet Tea and Magnolias and slamming screen doors. And that's not what it is anymore. And it never was only that. And you are way better versed than I am in what a Southern, what Southern literary history involves. So I, I want you to weigh in on this too, because I know just from my own reading for fun, not because I studied it in school, um, that uh, what people think about, the, they know about the South from those old literature classes, that's not, um, that's ne that's not all we, I mean, we were never only that. Um, we were, we were never only that. That world didn't represent indigenous peoples it, who, who, who were here first and who were still here. It didn't represent very accurately black people. It didn't, rec it didn't recognize or um, accommodate for immigrants. So, our, our, I think our literature does a much better job of, of that now. And it's also often very urban. I think, I mean, in your book, your book is, is a historical novel in a way, because it's not set during, I mean, it's set 20, 20 to 30 years ago. Um, but it's set in Nashville. It's not set in um, Oxford. It's not set in Jackson, you know? 
Yeah. Um, and I've, I, I've thought about this a lot and I go back and forth on it because when you look at, you know, all these maps that sort of, you know, geographically situate certain trends or ideas, it does seem to skew to the South. Uh, and it kind of almost looks like the Confederacy, right? I mean, when, when you look at a map of where's COVID bad, where's Trump popular, you know, where are people, you know, refusing to, you know, obey the rules about masks and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, I used to say that, you know, a big part of the reason that the, the Civil War happened was because you know, Southern white people are just so proud that they don't want to be told what to do, even if it's the right thing. But what occurred to me more recently, and I feel like you're writing about this quite a bit, is that it's not so much about a geographical location as it is about what happens when people are living in a tradition that is you know, connected to a, a, a past way of life that's really no longer, you know, it's kind of archaic, right? And, and antiquated, the, 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 the small town, the rural South, uh, the, the family farm, these things don't really, they don't, they don't really exist. Uh, they're, they're not they're for very many people anymore, whereas that was the norm for, for most of the South until the 20th century. And then you've got the growth of cities. And the reason why the map is so red down here is because we just don't have enough big cities. And the reason why the map is changing in Georgia is because Atlanta is a huge city and everybody that lives there kind of has to roll with the changes because they live around people that are not like them. They work with people that are not like them and they got to kind of let go of these old ways of thinking. And yeah, I think you can look at, and we were talking about this with Jessica before we went live, that, you know, places like Montana, which are as far from the so-called South as you could get, still also have small towns and ranching communities or family farms where people have a lot more in common with someone's idea of the South than do people who live where you and I live here in, you know, Boomtown that is, you know, growing at an astronomical rate and is, you know, full of skyscrapers and cranes. Well, it's true. I mean, I think it, we aren't the first to observe this by a long, long shot. I mean, it's something that's been happening and that po political scientists and pundits have been observing for a really long time. It's that it's not, it's not really politically, we're not regional so much as we are a, di a divide between urban and rural um, ways of thinking. Um, but, but I do for some reason, and, and sometimes I think I can articulate it and other times I'm not, I'm not sure. I still think that I would know a Southern novel when I saw one and, and, uh, and, and, and a Southern poem and a Southern essay. There's, there's a regional, there's a, there's a willingness to identify with region here that I don't see as clearly in other regions. I mean, we, and, and part of it is that um, the holdover from, you know, from the late unlamented Confederacy and, and part of it, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because everybody who lives in a blue city still has a, you know, a grandparent or a great grandparent out on the farm or out in a dying small town where the red, there used to be a red light and now there's a flashing yellow light or no light at all. And, um, and so there's a kind of um, dual citizenship almost for everybody, um, even people who live in big cities. Well, one of the things, again, that we were discussing before that just came to mind uh, uh, when we were preparing to come on was how popular late migrations has been in the Northwest. And, and you were asking Jessica, like, why do you, you know, I don't understand that. And, 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 and we all kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, no matter where you live, 
whether it be in the Pacific Northwest or in the you know, New England region or in the South, pretty much everybody has country cousins and everybody has a country grandmother or you know, something that, that feels like that. And, and I personally feel that, that one of the reasons that the main reason that your columns connect so powerfully uh, to so many people is that again and again and again, you tell these stories that resonate with uh, lived experience and with tradition that, that transcends region and transcends politics. And so on that note, uh, I picked out uh, a column that I wanted you to read, one of the ones that uh, I love the best, and it is on page 201. So I hope you have a book handy. I do. Jessica told me to, and I'm obedient. 201? <laughs> I got to change glasses to read. What? 201. 201. Okay. Why I wear five wedding rings? It's beautiful. Which part do you want me to read? I want you to read. Uh, well, let's see. I think you can read the whole thing. No, 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 no. These are all. all right. You don't want to read the whole thing? I've timed them. They're long. How about if I just read the first two or three paragraphs? All right. How about uh, on page 202 uh, from seven years ago to give me strength on 203? Start on 202? Start on 202. Seven years ago, first paragraph beginning on that page to the end of the paragraph that carries over. Okay, this, I wrote this essay in 2019, so I've actually been married 33 years, but uh, I'll read, I'll start. Seven years ago in the hospital where my mother was suddenly dying, I took the wedding band from her finger and slipped it on my own. At first, it was simply a way to keep the ring from being lost in the shock and tumult of unplanned grief. But I've continued to wear it year after year because it means what a wedding band is supposed to mean. Like the ring my husband gave me 31 years ago, it's a reminder of love and fidelity, of my patients, my, I'm sorry, of my parents' unshakable love for each other, but also of their love for me, as reliable as any immutable force. I'm the keeper of other family rings, my great-grandmothers, my grandmothers, my mother-in-laws. From time to time, I would take them out to ponder for a moment, but I had never thought to wear them. Along with my mother, these women are at the heart of the memoir that was about to send me out on a book tour. And one day it finally dawned on me that their wedding rings would make the perfect talismans against fear. They would remind me that worry is pointless that fretting about my own shortcomings as a public speaker will not make me a better public speaker. I took out the wedding rings of all my treasured forebears and put them on. In what might be another minor miracle, for we are clearly in the realm of magical thinking here, it worked. I stood in front of microphone after microphone, spinning the thin bands around and around my fingers And I looked out upon all those strangers, and lo, I was not afraid. Full disclosure, it's possible that menopause, which has fostered an oh, who in hell really cares attitude in me for some time now, may have dispensed with my lifelong stage fright too, and I just never noticed, having been on no stages in recent years. But I prefer to think the family matriarchy saved me that my beloved elders closed ranks around me, my mother and my mother-in-law on one flank, my grandmother and my great-grandmother on the other to shore me up and give me strength. This is absolutely beautiful. And I think, I, 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 you know, I know you don't, and I don't think that you should, but I like to read the, co- the comments on your Times columns because especially when it's one like that, there's usually about a hundred from people saying, I come here once a week to read Margaret Wrinkle because she makes me feel hopeful and better. 
and it's just such a bomb to people, even when you're writing about hard things. And 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 what you're gesturing to in this column is is kind of, you know, the the big hard thing that sort of set off the writing of late migrations and launched you in some ways on this journey. Um, a lot of your readers may not be aware that, uh, you know, right around this, I guess it was like you had started writing your columns irregularly. You just, what you know, kind of whenever they asked you to while you were writing late migrations. And then I guess it was at right around the time shortly after you, late migrations went under contract when you went into a weekly column isn't that about correct or were you all getting you were getting kind yeah, of yeah it's both of those contracts in the same year mm -hmm. um i am curious because it's so interesting to me how there is both this really clear contrast between the writing that you do in you know graceland at last as a columnist and the writing that you did in late migrations and you were doing these things kind of at the same time coping with deep emotions and and how did your work on one you know aid or inhibit the other well they're really they are two completely different kinds of writing even when i'm writing for the times um something that's more lyrical or more family, more of a memory. Mm -hmm. I, I, I tend to do these memory pieces more around the holidays, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Mother's Day uh, sometimes. But even those, it's, it's a different, I, it's a different audience, I guess, mm -hmm. for one thing. You can trust a reader who has voluntarily embarked on a book to hang in there with you. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to spell everything out. You don't have to, um, you can trust that if there's a little gap between what you've written and what you want them to take away from it, they're going to make that leap with you. Um, that's not necessarily a safe assumption with a newspaper audience, not because there are different readers. Most people who read books also read newspapers, but you read in a different sort of way. You read a book, or I read a book, especially word by word, you know, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph. And I consume the, the, the ephemeral media much more um, by gulps. And so there's an opportunity for misunderstanding there. And you do have to be, um, if you want to be understood, you have to be clear. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm not clear enough. And sometimes I, I see like 1200 comments piling up and I go, okay, well, I made somebody mad. No, nobody writes, no 1200 people write happy things, you know, <laughs> but it's, um, it, it was helpful when I was writing during the little bit of time, because really I had, um, I had more or less finished, um, I finished Graceland, I mean, I finished Late Migrations probably six months after I started writing for the Times every single week. But during that time, the, the way I was, I was able to sort of get my head in one space versus the other space is that I wrote all the newspaper columns on my computer. And I wrote all of the essays in late migrations by hand first in a notebook. And I think it does that writing by hand, first of all, it slows me down. So it allows me to, um, I don't know, it's a mysterious kind of alchemical thing that happens that it's like I, I, um, that hand brain coordination is different when it's one hand versus two hands is all I can figure but it's it just helps me it, or it might just be almost like a little pavlovian thing that when the black notebook is out and the pen is in hand that i'm in a different mental space that makes perfect sense and it doesn't surprise me at all to hear it uh i, I think that a ritual like that particularly when when you look at a book like late migrations where there's 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 a kind of uh, you know, forgive me here, because I know it's, it, it turns your ears pink to hear people talk about you this way, but there's a sort of sacredness to it. 
Uh, and no, no, no. It, it, listen, I, that I I knew as soon as I read it that that people were going to be you know, we're going to connect on with this book in a really spiritual way. And I think that uh, you know that practice of the notebook, the pen that you like the best, or you know that cool pencil, and the the slow cadence of kind of drawing your words is such a, a an appropriate way of doing it. And of course, I'm sure you probably wrote all of your poems back when you were a poet uh, by hand in a notebook, right? Uh, people who know you well and have been following you are probably aware that you started out as, 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 as a kind of a, a, a prodigy in poetry and then you started teaching and then things, your, your, your life just kind of went in a different direction. Can you talk a little bit about your journey from poet slash teacher to, uh, you know, essayist and, and, and journalist or op-ed columnist, however you want to call it? Yeah, it's, it, I guess it feels like I, I made a big 180 but I, it, it didn't feel that way to me. It felt like a, um, it was all of a piece. You know, when I was in, my, my, my parents bought me my, an Underwood noiseless portable typewriter. Was, I think I looked it up and I think it goes back to the twenties at a, at a garage sale when I was 14 and said I was going to be a writer when I grew up. But the very first thing I did when I got to high school was join the newspaper staff. And it was a, a, a full, it was an hour and a half long class because it was a full class plus a study hall, the other half of lunch. And I was on the, the newspaper staff for four years in, in high school. It was a journalism class. And then in college, I was on the school magazine, the student magazine staff. And in grad school, part of my, um, even though I was in the creative writing program, my, my part of my assistantship came, I was, I was the advisor to the school newspaper and, and I worked on the school magazine. So I had that side of writing always, but um, when I was teaching and when I was, then it was just poetry because poetry is um, something you can do in smaller chunks of time. It's really hard um, you know, I mean, you're a teacher. It's really hard to take on a big book length project and still be prepared for class and grade the papers and meet with the parents. And, um, and I, and I just didn't, we had, you know, Sam and it's, and it was just like, there was no way I was going to be doing anything, any real heavy lifting. I, that hats off to you that you wrote two books and parented two little kids and still taught high school the whole time I couldn't do it. What happened when I got put on bed rest before our second child was born is that, um, you know, there wasn't any maternity leave that was gonna, you know, I had to find a way to make money flat on my back. Hmm. And so I started writing essays and I, and I, I still believe that essays are kind of, um, they're kind of like poems, but easier to write and easier to read. So they're, they're not like poems in any true, like, you know, if, if when I was still writing poetry, I'd heard somebody say that I would have, you know, I would have been mad because it's way harder to be a poet than to be an essay, but that essayist, but it's the same, very same kind of subjects that I was trying to write about as a poet. I started writing about in prose and I realized that there was just beginning to be a market for essays in mainstream publications, magazines, and newspapers, and there, and there had not ever been before. I mean, creative nonfiction wasn't even a, 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 a category you could study when I was in school, and now it's, it's a huge category, and um, I think we are in a way in a kind of golden age for creative nonfiction. There's so many wonderful writers who are doing it, and they're not feeling, it's not like I did. I, when I stopped writing poems, I just I kind of never went back, but plenty of people go back and forth. They write novels and they write poems. They write novels and they write essays. They write essays and they write poems. You know, they're just, it, we don't have to be locked into these categories. We just, um, it's really wonderful. Well, I would argue that you, you, you go back quite a bit. You just don't use line breaks 
there are, <laughs> are, are some, some pages of yours, some paragraphs, including some of the ones you just read that uh, sound like poetry to me. Um, even for people who have been keeping up with your work pretty consistently in the times, I really think this book is essential because of the way that you chose to organize it. Whereas I think a lot of people would, would lay it out chronologically, you have laid it out in sections kind of according to theme. And some of the questions in our conversation, I, I, I've tried to sort of spread them around uh, according to those, you know, to the, the, the five wedding rings relates to family and community. Uh, you know, talking about late migrations, which is so much about your relationship uh, with nature and the connections between family and nature with, you know, flora and fauna. Um, we talked a little bit about politics and region, but I feel like in our personal conversations, as well as in your writing, uh, you know, one of, if not the most urgent theme for you has been uh, the environment and trying to write about you know, these, these narratives that illustrate both, you know, the sort of uh, peril that, that we are in alongside, uh, you know, hopeful, practical, uh, uh, on the ground, right next to you, things that people are doing and that can be done to, uh, you know, give us a chance to 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 to, to save our, ourselves and, and and undo some of the damage that we've done and i'm curious uh both within the collection and outside because you've written a lot of columns since the collection was assembled what what do you think has been the most valuable lesson that that you've learned in your in your interviews and in your research and your own life experience uh, that, you know, you can kind of pass on to people about, about, you know, what, what we can and should be doing like tomorrow to give ourselves a little bit of hope and do something, uh, that will make an actual impact as we're, you know, facing down, you know, real peril. Well, I think my, the, the biggest takeaway I probably have is that, um, just in the in the the stuff I've learned and continue to learn is that where to begin? I, I think um, it's very easy to become discouraged. The 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 news from the environment is just so devastating, and it has been for some time but it hasn't been visible to most people. If you're trying to get the lunch boxes packed and you're trying to sign the permission forms and you're trying to find the shoes that match and you know the blouse that doesn't have spit up on it and you're trying to get the dog you know, to get in the crate so you can go to work, it, it, this is not gonna be the top of your mind probably, but you can't avoid it when you're looking at one half the country where people are drowning in their bedrooms because a wall of water is coming through the window. And in the other half of the country, the entire world seems to be in flames. It's not possible, even the way it was when I first started writing this column, to ignore it anymore. And so the, the sense that it's too late, we've done too little and we've done it too late, is almost overwhelming. But you have to remind yourself that there is no difference between being so discouraged that you can't act and being so deliberately blind you don't believe it's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, those two feelings, though they are completely diametrically opposed, result in the same thing, which is paralysis. Nothing happens. And so it's very easy to just go, well, this piddly little thing I'm trying to do, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to use any more, I'm not going to use any more 
single use plastics. That's going to mean I can't get strawberries until strawberries are available in the farmer's market. I can't get strawberries in December anymore. It's going to mean, you know, that I'm going to have to think ahead and have my own bottle of water when I think I'm going to be thirsty. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a practical thing you can do. Um, so much of what we can do to help is just to, if we could just stop doing the things that's bad, you know, like if we, when I was growing up, I remember, you know, taking the Coke bottles down to the, to the, to the store for my grandmother, just walking the bottles down to the store and trading them in, you know, we, there's just, it, it hasn't been all that long that we've been a disposable society. Hmm. So those things add up. They clearly have added up because now there's a mountain of plastic bottles in the middle of the ocean. I mean, we can do things like not putting um, poison on our yard. Let the clover take over. Yes. Let the violets have their way with your grass and you, the bees will come back. They just will be there. You won't even have to do anything and give up Mosquito Joe and Mosquito Squad. Just put the mosquito spray on yourself or turn a fan on when you're sitting outside. I mean, all these things feel small. And, and of course the fossil fuel industry wants us to think it's all in our hands and it's not all in our hands. It's gonna require immense political motivation and it's gonna require the cooperation of the market, which is already responding. It's so much cheaper now to, to get electricity from solar energy than from any other source. And, and when, that, when, that's hap when that happens, the market response. So I think that there are a lot of things that we can do and I write extensively about them all the way through. But the, the big thing is just to find a way, whatever it takes, not to give up, not to say it's done because I, I would like to have grandchildren someday. And I would like, <laughs> I would like them to know, you know, Karen Russell has a, a, a short story in this uh, week's issue of the New Yorker that's about a post borrowed world. And I don't think I can read it. I can't, I can't bear to think about a word, a world with no songbirds. And, um, and, but we don't have to, we don't have to go there yet. It's, we're not there yet. We have a little bit of time left. I love hearing you talk about hope and, and it reminds me uh, and you, 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 you wrote a, you, you included a column in here about John Lewis, uh, and you were able to interview him for chapter 16, because uh, that was before you were writing for the Times, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I remember what he said to you about, uh, about hope and about optimism and never getting bitter, uh, can you talk about a little bit about that experience and what you took away from it and, and how it contributed to the way that you wrote that column? Well, the column, you're, um, the column quotes from the interview. The, inter right. the interview ran at ch chapter16.org and you can read the whole thing by going to chapter 16 and just putting John Lewis in the search and field. To do that, it's- beautiful. Yeah, it's a wonderful interview. Um, the interview and what I did with the column when when um, John Lewis was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, um, I wrote an open letter to John Lewis, and our and I in in that column I I I told the story of interviewing him, and of just how embarrassed I was. He was coming. He 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 began his career as an activist in Nashville. Um, he came here to go to Bible college. Um, but he, he took the training, um, in how to do peaceful, nonviolent resistance. Not everybody who took that training was allowed to go on. I mean, some people just, if some, you know, they practice dumping ice water down their shirts and hitting them and, um, shoving them off stools, like on a lunch counter. And some people just instinctively would hit back. And John Lewis, he really, he really, at this incredibly formative age, he learned to be peaceful, even in the face of fury and terrible, horrible hatred. And so he, um, he had written with um, two collaborators, an illustrator and a writer, 
um, the story of his life in the form of a, basically a comic book. It was a graphic nonfiction memoir, and it had just won the National Book Award. The third volume did. And he was already coming to Nashville to accept the Nashville Public Library Literary Award. And so um, all of that happened in the same week that Donald Trump got elected president. And so here he was coming back to Nashville to accept this huge award. And because that's not just a local award, that's a national award. And it's a lifetime achievement award. You don't get it for just a particular book the way you get with the National Book Award. And he was, and, um, and I didn't see this coming at all, but I sat down to interview him and I immediately started crying. I just, tears just started pouring down my cheeks and, and I was, and I didn't, I hadn't, I wasn't anticipating tears. So I didn't have a handkerchief and I always poorly prepared and snot was running. It was terrible. And I was so embarrassed. It's like, what is this old white woman doing sitting in a chair, weeping with despair over an election result? And here is a guy who got his head split open by an Alabama state trooper on a horse trying to walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on a march from Selma to Montgomery. And when I was just a little tiny toddler and it was embarrassing, but he didn't try to make me feel like, you know, a baby, you know, he just said, this is, the way justice always works. It's sometimes there are setbacks and you can't let the setbacks make you feel, give up in the, give up on the cause or make you feel that it's a waste of your time to keep fighting. And it was exactly what I needed to hear, even though it was absolutely impertinent for me to have expected him to comfort me in that moment. I think I'm gonna cry. Beautiful. Uh, and it's kind of a grace note. And I thought kind of for my last question before we go to questions from the viewing audience, uh, Graceland at last, let's talk about Graceland, Margaret. Let's <laughs> talk about Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, let's talk about coming full circle. As you yeah, the, the book, the last essay in the book is called Graceland at Last. And it's about how, how when, when Haywood and I were first moving to Nashville, we were getting from graduate school in Columbia, South Carolina, over the Appalachian Mountains to Nashville. And, you know, in those days, <laughs> we just had a little, I just had a little, we were in two cars. And, um, I had a little, uh, like a cassette player on the seat next to me. And it was stuck on that, on that song, on that album, um, the Paul Simons album, Graceland. And it was just this harrowing journey over the mountains <laughs> in two broken down cars, badly loaded by a couple of graduate students with a cat that needed to pee, you know, with her claws on my head, stand, sitting on the back of the seat with her claws, like literally in my head. And I remember listening to that song over and over and over again and thinking, if I live to get over Mont Eagle Mountain, I am going to make it to Graceland. <laughs> that was, that was 1987. And I didn't get there until 2017, 30 years later, we finally made it to Graceland. And that's what that essay is about. And what did you think about it when you got there? I loved it <laughs> so much. I loved it so much because it was just, it was exactly what you would think a poor boy would would make uh, the home a poor boy would make for himself when he had a bunch of money. <laughs> you know, it's nothing like what wealthy people think of as a great house. You know, it's um, it's sort of a faux um, antebellum 
house and it has mirrors everywhere and white carpet and it has there's a jungle room where there's actual like plant, you know <laughs> plants growing out of things in the wall and um weird shaped creatures on the tables anyway it it was it it was just um it was just so magnificent it felt like um like i know what it's like to grow up poor white in this rural south and um and i just i don't know i just i i felt that i knew something about elvis presley from seeing that house that i would never know from his music or his movies or even interviews with him when he was still alive do you think that's why for so there have been so many great songs there are so many people who uh go into graceland as a kind of pilgrimage a, a religious experience uh do you think it's less about elvis than it is about the connection that people have with the idea of a dirt poor kid from tupelo mississippi you know lighting the world on fire and and building himself the house of his little Tupelo, Mississippi dreams. <laughs> I think most of the people who go to Graceland are there for Elvis. They're just like, there for Elvis. There's, I don't think very many of them are there the way you and I would go to, to Graceland. But we were there with our youngest son and our, um, and our exchange student from Australia. That's right. And the exchange that. student from Australia just loved it. That's he amazing. just really loved it. Now I want to compare and contrast Graceland with Dolly World. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Tennessee. Well, Dolly's world, Dolly, Dollywood is a theme park. It's nothing like Graceland. Graceland's an actual home. And in fact, um, Lisa Marie Presley still has, you know, keeps the upstairs private. That, that's where her, she stays when she's in Memphis. Oh, wow. I did not know that. You can't go up there. That's her house. Wow. That's so cool. <laughs> it kind of makes me happy. Amazing. <laughs> um, well, are you ready for some questions from the audience? Yeah. Fantastic. So Nina says, uh, thank you both for your work and for being available to your readers. Uh, here's my question. She had a little bit of a false start earlier, but we don't need to know about that. Uh, <laughs> Margaret, you write from your experience and share your family stories. And your stories are rooted in your experience, but with fictionalized names and places. What are the limitations of sharing transparently your own stories? And conversely, what are the freedoms? Um, well, lately I've been fantasizing about how much fun it would be to write a novel where I didn't have to embed links that the fact checkers could verify that I'm actually saying what something that's true. Um, but in terms of writing about um, family, you know, one thing that's, in, that's true for, I think, probably, and Ed will have to talk about this, but you know, just because you're writing something that's true about your family doesn't mean that you're writing everything that's true. I mean, there is a selection process, there is a winnowing and a shaping, and it doesn't mean in any way that you're misleading or you're leaving out um, facts or events that would obviate what you've already said. It's that um, there's an artistry to it in the same way that there's an artistry to shaping any piece of writing. I think for my part, um you know, one of the reasons why I, I, I write fiction is, uh, you know, I want to write about emotions and experiences that are, that are important to me that often come out of, of my own life from my family and, and to, you know, have freedom to, to indulge my own perspective. Because one of the things that I've found out, you know, a lot when you, when you write about your family is that, uh, nobody remembers it exactly the same way that you do. And people will take issue with you about getting it wrong. Um, 
I really, I, I, I will say with my, my most recent uh, novel set in Nashville, my mother was really excited about it because she said, I'm so glad that you, you know, set this book in Nashville. And I said, why? And she said, so people won't come up to me in the grocery store and ask me how much of it's <laughs> good. And, you know, she used to have that experience with my first novel, which is set in a town very similar to my hometown. And everybody was always trying to figure out who was who and what was what. And, I mean, there were certainly some things that I was inspired by that people could recognize. But the idea is that you, you know, you, you, you're not telling a true story. You're taking, you know, a cool or interesting or, or shocking anecdote or, or some emotion and amplifying it or changing things around that allows you uh, in a way that allows you to, you know, explore possibilities without having to tell the truth. I said recently, and our, our, our mutual friend, Ann Patchett, uh, said uh, about her novel, Commonwealth, which is the one that was kind of closest to home for her, that her mother, when people would ask her uh, how much of this book is true, she would say, uh, none of it happened and all of it's true. And I thought that, you know, that that's kind of what I'm, what I'm going for. Um, I think if I had more 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 confidence and more courage that I'd I'd write the way Margaret does and I'd probably have more readers. Uh, but for now I think I'll just uh, I'll stick with uh, making it up in, in in my own way and just tolerate the fact that you know people are gonna you know draw conclusions about what they think is real and be most of the time wrong about it. Let's make a deal. If I write a novel, you write a memoir. All right. <laughs> you he, knows that make that deal. he knows that's a safe bet. You first. <laughs> it's on the internet now. <laughs> Can't take it back. Yeah, yeah. Um, Christina says, you offer hope for the South. What variations politically do you see in the South, particularly with your experiences in Alabama and Tennessee? Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of variation between Alabama and Tennessee. There's not a whole lot of variation between Alabama and, and Mississippi or Louisiana or Arkansas or Kentucky. I mean, there's, there's small changes. Um, Kentucky, for example, has, um, and so does Louisiana, a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. Alabama, for example, the, the governor of Alabama issued a mask mandate during the lockdowns last year. Tennessee's governor did not. I mean, there are some differences, but the differences are very small by and large within all of the red states. And I don't just mean Southern red states, I mean red states everywhere. And that's because these, um, there's a wonderful book by Nancy McLean called Democracy in Chains. And it describes the, the, the founding of the Coke network and empire and what those um, political, their, their intentions with the way they did their political donations and what they have done, what that entire network has done is to create is to fund these small time politicians in the in the red states and take and they have completely taken over um, red state legislatures and governor's offices by and large and what they are they are systematically dismantling American democracy by um, funding the candidates they want to be in those in those places and so there it's not by accident at all that if you know, there's a heartbeat bill um, in, in Alabama, there will be a nearly identical one in every other red state almost immediately. The wording will be shockingly identical. Um, and it's just because, um, and, and often these, these political realities don't bear any resemblance to what the people in the state want. Like in Tennessee, for example, we have not expanded Medicaid, but Met Medicaid expansion is, is hugely popular. Some 80 something percent of Tennesseans want it. They just aren't getting it. 
I better stop talking about that now. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, Barbara says, do you still volunteer at the English language program you spoke about in What is America to Me? Um, I did it. I don't anymore. I did um, one semester. And during that one semester, I started writing um, weekly instead of monthly for the Times. And it was and I had a full time job as an editor still at that time. The great thing about that volunteer experience was that I could do it. The school started at seven o'clock in the morning. It started actually more like six fifty. So I could be back at my desk you know, by the time my work day started at nine, but it was just a lot. And I, I always meant to go back and I still might, I hope someday be able to go back, but it's, it, there, there just had to be some realities about my, my um, father-in-law was getting more needy and it just was time to draw back a little closer to home. Excellent. And Pete says, in what ways did your literary education, both at school and on your own, and your love of reading, affect the way you approach writing? Um, I think most writers would probably say some variation on follow, th that, that, that we fell in love with reading first and then wanted in the same way that a little kid, you know, sees somebody, you know, on a skateboard jump a curb and wants to try to do that. You see something that you find magnificent and you want to try your hand at it. Is that what you think, Ed? Oh, absolutely. I think that, you know, for me, it's that it, the feeling of, you know, I, I just want to be able to do for somebody else what this did for me. That would be such a high and um it is isn't it i mean it, it makes you the, the thing that and i know this is true for you uh that that really humbled and amazed me after i uh started getting feedback from real readers was how things that felt so kind of very personal or, or even just things that felt a little bit, you know, tossed off or hazard uh, really resonated deeply with people in ways that I could not have anticipated. And I just do, I feel like that is something that is magical and spiritual and I have nothing to do with it. And I don't <laughs> want to get all, you know, uh, too weird on you, but uh, I mean, you know, I've told you before, Margaret, I mean, you know, when my mother had your book in her book club and all of her friends were sitting around the table, they were sharing stories. And, and I mean, it, it, it was something that was deeply personal for every person sitting around that table. And, uh, you know, you, you created something magical there just in, in telling, you know, the truth of your memory. And, you know, my favorite was one of my, you know, mom's friends brought on this old fur that our grandmother used to wear that had been in a box in the closet for like 40 years and it was like the first time in, in decades that she you know talked and shared and and had that kind of deep experience with um you know with memory and with grief and with love and and nostalgia and you know you did that you created that magic for people and um you know, I know a lot of it does come out of your gift, but I also think that there's there's something magical about it. Absolutely. Well, a little self-service bookseller question uh, to finish out the night. What are you reading right now? What are you reading, Ed? You first. What am I reading? I am, I am, I just finished and I'm ashamed that it took me so long to read this, but I just last night finished um, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Tova Bailey. And that book is came out in 2010. And it's been on my shelf probably since not too long after that. And we, my husband and I were getting ready to go up to a friend's cabin for the weekend and it was gonna rain. And um, I was trying to think, what do I wanna read? And I brought a whole bunch of things just to have options. and. And there's something about being in the woods 
in, in a cabin with a metal roof in the rain. And that the idea of <laughs> the idea of reading about a snail really appealed to me. And it is just this magnificent little book. I just loved every word of it. The sound of a wild snail eating. That's beautiful. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I've got a, about four different books going, but uh, the one that I'm taking with me uh, tomorrow uh, is by my friend, uh, the Reverend Becca Stevens. It's called uh, Practically Divine, and it just came out. And uh, uh, it's, it's really good. So uh, I highly recommend it to anybody who's interested uh, after you pick up Graceland. Yes. And I did just uh, a few minutes ago drop back yeah, into yeah. the chat uh, the reminder that if you didn't grab Graceland at last and the fortunate ones with your registration, you can still do that. Uh, just visit booksincommonnw.com and click on the logo of your favorite sponsoring store to find all sorts of yummy treasures. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to get some of these other wonderful books that have been mentioned into the chat as well. Um, but I want to extend sincere gratitude to both of you for joining us this evening and sharing Graceland at last with us. Um, I'm, we're so excited for it here at Country Bookshelf. Um, and I know all of our sister stores in um, Sisters Oregon and Seattle uh, are very excited as well. Uh, we still have signed copies at Country Bookshelf. Um, just to steal the, the thunder of my sister stores there. <laughs> um, so if you want a signed copy, visit countrybookshelf.com um, and we'll get you a signed copy uh, while supplies last. <laughs> thank you both so much for joining us thank you to our audience for joining us this evening um it was absolutely wonderful and i hope y'all have a great night thanks so much jessica thanks ed thank you, thank you jessica thank you margaret